I'm Francis Dang. I'm a board certified neuroradiologist, and today I'm going to go over with you the imaging findings of a recent medical malpractice case. In this case, this is a 32 year old male who presented to a chiropractor with neck pain, but I want to give you only the information provided to the radiologist at the time, which was the reason for exam of pain slash dissection. Now, a non-con head CT was performed, and I'll tell you uh, in a first pass through the kind of basic findings, and then through the set of three imaging studies, I'll go over with you the more advanced findings. So the basic findings on the non-con head CT was that there was no hyperdensity to indicate an acute intracranial hemorrhage, nor was there a hypodensity of the posterior fossa structures to indicate an acute territorial infarct. Now, you should know that at this time point, in a patient presenting within a few hours of acute onset neurologic deficits, CT is not very sensitive in detecting acute ischemic stroke, especially in the posterior fossa, which is subject to streak artifacts from the skull base. So we cannot rely on CT to exclude an acute ischemic stroke. But as far as major findings like acute intracranial hemorrhage, there was no signs of that. The patient went on to have a CTA of the neck, and here, the immediate finding that should be apparent is that there's non-opacification of the basal artery. Uh, as we scroll further to the basilar tip, there is reopacification. And as we scroll inferiorly, we see that the vertebral artery on the left side is opacified, but we don't see a vertebral artery on the right side. As we scroll down into the neck, the left vertebral artery has a tight narrowing right at its dural penetration. So this is the uh, transition between the V3 segment and the V4 segment. The V4 segment is the intradural segment. The V3 segment is the distal cervical segment. And we can see that as we trace this vertebral artery further, it becomes a normal caliber or uh, becomes a normal caliber here, which is the V2 segment. However, in the intervening portion, there is an area where it is quite narrowed right here with some surrounding non-opacified structure, which is suspicious for intramural hematoma. We can see on the right side, the right vertebral artery is quite small. So in the V2 segment, we can see a vertebral artery. It is surrounded by enhancing venous structures. This is the vertebral artery venous plexus. And once we trace it to the V3 segment, we kind of lose it altogether but this is likely an anatomic variation. So to summarize the CTA findings, there is a severe narrowing of the distal V3 and also proximal V3 left vertebral artery that is suspicious for intramural hematoma, i.e. a vertebral artery dissection, and the reconstitution of the intradural vertebral artery, but then a sudden cutoff of that contrast at the basal artery. So this is basal artery occlusion. Now, um, the next day, the patient went on to get an MRI. On the DWI sequence, we see extensive infarcts in the cerebellum as well as the brainstem and none in the cerebrum. Okay, so those are the basic findings. Let me go back to the non-con head CT for some advanced findings. In retrospect, there is a hyperdensity along the left vertebral artery V3 segment. This can be considered a dense vessel sign of sorts. In retrospect, this represents the intramural hematoma that is hyperdense because it represents kind of coagulated blood. Now, I would say a reasonable radiologist would not have called this prospectively. It's only in retrospect can we identify this finding. However, I would say on the CT angiogram that a reasonable radiologist would be able to identify that this is a vertebral artery dissection. So this appearance of irregular luminal narrowing in a cervical arteries such as the vertebral artery should be suspicious for a dissection in the correct clinical context. The differential includes atherosclerotic narrowing as well as congenital variation. However, this narrowing is quite long segment, taper narrowing, and then it reconstitutes to a normal size vessel interdurally, and that would be suspicious. This finding of a thick, non-enhancing soft tissue outside the opacified lumen has been described as the suboccipital rind sign. And this refers to the intramural hematoma, which is non-enhancing, separating the suboccipital fat from the enhancing lumen of the vertebral artery. This scan is a little bit challenging because there's a lot of venous contamination, meaning that the images are obtained in a phase that includes both arterial contrast enhancement 
as well as venous contrast enhancement, we can see contrast within the internal jugular veins, for instance. And so some of the contrast that you see around here represents the so-called suboccipital cavernous sinus, which is a venous plexus that surrounds the V3 vertebral artery. And as you scroll further, you can also see contrast within the vertebral artery venous plexus, which surrounds the you know, uh, cervical segments. What separates the enhancing lumen of the vertebral artery and this venous plexus is abnormal, and that represents intramural hematoma. In this case, the reading radiologist was primarily focused on the abnormalities of the right vertebral artery. Now we see the right vertebral artery is small diffusely throughout from its origin, from the subclavian artery up through the V1 segment, where it enters the foramen transversarium is the V2 segment, and then into the V3 segment, we barely see it. We kind of um, lose it uh, in between all the venous contrast enhancement. And then we don't see it at all in the intradural portion. We don't see a right V4 segment. There is a twig here that is probably the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which branches early from the V3 segment in this case. In other cases, it may branch from the V4 segment. But I think this twig here is the pica that is taking off from the distal cervical right vertebral artery and irrigating the medial posterior inferior cerebellum on the right side. Now, uh, it is important to note that this is an anatomic variation and not an acute abnormality, and we can be confident of that if we take a look at the bone windows. So if we were to window this to look at the bones, you would see that the right frame and transversarium in the cervical spine, it's much smaller than the left side. This indicates that the small caliber of the right vertebral artery represents a congenital variation because if this vertebral artery did not develop to an appropriate size during development, the bone around it will not develop a hole of the same size. The two come hand in hand. And so because this frame and transversarium is small, we know that the small caliber of the right vertebral artery is merely an anatomic variation. Now it is fine to have one hypoplastic vertebral artery and one dominant vertebral artery. This is a very common anatomic variation. In this case, however, this patient's dominant vertebral artery has dissected. It's created an intramural hematoma. It's caused a severe narrowing of the residual lumen. And this dissection is highly thrombogenic. So what has happened is that the dissection has created thrombus that has flicked off and gone into the basal artery and caused a basal artery occlusion. Now, the basal artery occlusion is an important emergent finding to make because in this case, it would have swayed the treating clinicians to think that this patient was having acute ischemic stroke as opposed to other etiologies of neck pain or altered mental status, such as meningitis, and would lead down a very different treatment pathway with potential for thrombolysis and or thrombectomy. The pertinent imaging findings to report in this situation are number one, that there is a basal artery occlusion, and number two, that there is a vertebral artery dissection. But even going beyond a level further, it is important to note the anatomic variability here that the right vertebral artery is congenitally hypoplastic. It does not connect with the basal artery, so that route of access would not be available to do a thrombectomy of the basal artery. You would have to go through the dissected vertebral artery. It is also important to note that the vertebral artery is not occluded altogether. It is severely narrowed by the, is this intramural hematoma. Um, it may be technically challenging to traverse this stenosis, but it, it may still be possible. So a consultation with a neurointerventionalist is required. It's also uh, helpful to note that the distal basal artery is reconstituted. And how does the distal basal reconstitute when you have a basal artery occlusion? Well, we have collateral circulation through the circle of Willis. In this case, if you window it appropriately, you can see that there is a left posterior communicating artery here, which connects the internal carotid artery with the posterior cerebral artery. But there's also a right-sided posterior communicating artery. So this person has a relatively full circle of Willis that allows the anterior circulation to supply much of the posterior circulation. It is what the brain, uh, what tissue is at risk uh, at the time of this basal artery occlusion is whatever is supplied at the level that is occluded, right? Distally, um, at the distal basal artery, which irrigates the brainstem and the thalami, that is still maintained by the collateral circulation through the circle of Willis. 
What is at risk here is the pawns as well as parts of the cerebellum. And so what we see on the subsequent brain MRI, which was obtained much later, that we see diffusion restriction in bilateral cerebellar hemispheres as well as a large portion of the pons, sparing of the midbrain, sparing of the thalami, and sparing of the medial temporal occipital lobes, which would be irrigated by the posterior cerebral arteries, which in this case are predominantly supplied by the anterior circulation through the circular willis. An interesting finding here is that there is bilateral inferior cerebellar infarction. Why would that happen when you had a left vertebral artery dissection and a basal artery occlusion? The basal artery doesn't supply this part of the cerebellum, nor does the left vertebral artery in most cases. We had a hypoplastic right vertebral artery, and in cases of congenital hypoplasia, the brain develops alternative ways to irrigate the, you know, the usual territory of the brain. In this case, what has likely happened is that the ICA takes over the territory that would have been supplied by a normal-sized pica. Remember, on the right side, we had a very small pica that's probably only supplying part of the right cerebellar hemisphere. In this case, it is likely that a dominant ICA, which comes off the basal artery, would supply the usual pica territory, which is the posterior and inferior part of the cerebellar hemisphere. Right? And this is the very inferior tip of the right cerebellar hemisphere. So this is actually in the basal artery territory through a dominant ICA. So in this case, the key structures that are infarcted here are in the pons, and this patient did end up with a locked-in syndrome. What would happen if the MRI for the initial imaging study obtained, would we have been able to make a diagnosis of vertebral artery dissection and basal artery occlusion? I think the answer is yes. Based on the DWI, one additional finding to note is here at the level of the skull base or just below the skull base, uh, we can see a hyperintensity that has a crescentic shape, moon-shaped uh, around a, a dark, uh, uh, dark signal focus, right? This represents part of the intramural hematoma of that left vertebral artery V3 segment. In addition, we see this curvilinear high signal intensity uh, that represents an additional portion of that intramural hematoma, the distal V3 segment. So it has been shown that routine brain MRI DWI sequence, if you observe at the level of the skull base, you can identify uh, with a sensitivity of more than 80% acute dissections of the cervical internal carotid artery or the cervical vertebral artery. And this is such a case that if you look closely, this cres crescentic high signal intensity that represents the intramural hematoma of the dissection. Additional findings on other pulse sequences show that we have lost the normal flow void of that left vertebral artery. So normal flowing blood on spin echo sequences like a T2 weighted sequence or sometimes a T1 weighted sequence, you should see a nice dark hole representing flowing blood because flowing blood causes you to lose signal. And so a normal carotid artery, for instance, is quite uh, nice and round and dark on this sequence. Here's the right carotid artery, but the left vertebral artery is right on T2. So this is loss of the flow void, and this represents either an occlusion or very slow flow. We can't tell on MRI the difference between very slow and occluded flow, but we can tell that on the prior CTA that there was um, a severe narrowing, which could cause you know uh, upstream slow flow and loss of the flow void. So this is what intramural hematoma looks like on a T2-weighted sequence. We have that high signal intensity of uh, slowly flowing blood in the main lumen, and then this more intermediate signal intensity representing the intramural hematoma. So those are all the findings on the CT, CTA, and the MRI exam of this patient. To summarize, I would say that the non-con head CT, you would not be able to prospectively call this intramural hematoma, but in retrospect, we can notice it that there was no early ischemic change at this time because the patient presented within the early window after onset of symptoms and there was no intracranial hemorrhage, they would have been a uh, candidate for thrombolysis. Important to note that in the consideration of thrombolysis, that their dissection on the CTA does not extend intradurally. Uh, if the dissection clearly extended into the intradural segment, that is a V4 segment, if you apply thrombolytics, uh, 
and that caused a worsening of their dissection and rupture that would cause a life-threatening subarachnoid hemorrhage. So distinguishing between extracranial and intracranial cervical artery dissection is an important thing to weigh in the risk and benefit of giving thrombolysis. In addition, you know, uh, in the current um, level of evidence for basal artery occlusions, uh, certainly this patient would be a potential candidate for thrombectomy because they presented within uh, the first day of onset of symptoms. At the point that the MRI was obtained, that was still within the first day. However, what was apparent on the MRI was that there was completed infarction of the at-risk tissue, that is nearly the entire pons, as well as part of the pica and ica territories of the cerebellum. And so at this point, there would be likely, based on the imaging findings, very little tissue that is still at risk but salvageable if you were to perform a thrombectomy. So that's the evolution of this patient's unfortunate case. And I want to thank MedMal Reviewer for obtaining these images and for the patient and their family for consenting to release these images publicly so that we may all learn from them.